Good morning. We are coming to you from Doers of the Word Baptist Church at 14781 Sperry Road, Newbury, Ohio. You are listening to us this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That's the Eagle, 104.3 FM in Tampa and Ocala. And uh, this morning in the pulpit is Chaplain John McTurn, co-founder of Cops for Christ International and a former 26-year special U.S. Treasury agent. And uh, John is going to, well... Here he is, John McTurney. Well, thank, thank you, Pastor Ernie. And uh, earlier, you said that, uh, I think you said, I know everything. <laughs> okay, well, I've spoken several times. Right. And there's one thing that I want you to remember so that uh, you'll never forget it. What two important things happened in May 1948? Okay, Israel became a nation and John McTurney was born. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if you don't know that inside joke, I was speaking at a... We had a little seminar, remember? Yeah. And when I'm speaking about Israel and prophecy, I, I'll, I'll say two very important things happened in 1948. One is the nation of May of 1948. One is the nation of Israel. And the other, people don't seem to know as much, but it's, as a, it's equally as important. So Pastor Ernie says, wait, don't tell me. I know, remember? I got, I got you good. And he said, S yeah, it's some alignment of the stars. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you sure? Let me think. Don't tell me. So then I said, well, I was born May 21st, 1948. Well, oh, right, and a star was born. Yeah, a star. And you said, oh, I swallowed that one up by and sinker. So, but, uh, so you, you didn't forget that, did you? No, I did it right up here. Okay. Um, I'm really blessed to be here today. I have a lot, a lot to, uh, to share. Um, I would like to just, I want to share the real good stuff that's happening in my ministry because it's real exhorting. Uh, this little brochure that I wrote uh, two years ago now, Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. I have some back there. Please take as many as you could use. Uh, it's gone viral. We, I, I lost count of how many have printed. It's probably over three million now. And it's really doing the job in India. We have a backlog of four million in India. Uh, in, in India alone, there's a backlog of four million. So we, it's tr it's translated into five Indian languages, uh, Urdu, in uh, Pakistan, and believe it or not, I don't know if I shared this, but I I have a ministry. You can consider me a missionary in Pakistan, and I preach live. So it's really cute. Every morning, my wife will ask me, "What are you doing today?" So when when it first happened, she said, "What?" I said, well, I'm going to be preaching in Pakistan. She said, preaching in Pakistan? I said, yeah, about 11 o'clock. And what happened is we have a, if you're familiar with Skype, we have a Skype hookup. So uh, they have a generator in Pakistan, and they have it all set up there. So I sit at my desk, and I preach live in Pakistan. And I see the people, and they see me. I'll, I'll wave to the crowd like this, and they wave back. So I, pre I don't know how many times I've spoken now in Pakistan. But I led hundreds and probably into the thousands now of Muslims and Hindus to the Lord. And it's all over this message. This message here. I preached John 3.16 and Jesus Christ came to heal the broken heart. And it cuts right through Islam. Right? Because you see, religion can never heal a broken heart. It can never. God has reserved the healing of the broken heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And people have broken hearts, and only Hinduism cannot heal it, Islam cannot heal it, no ism can heal it, Catholicism can't heal it, only the Lord Jesus, he's the great physician. So uh, I have them back there. Now, this one here, now this is going to sound like an odd question, but I'm going someplace with it. Who here likes Chinese food? Just about it. You don't like Chinese food? Uh, no, I, knew there, I knew there was something wrong with you. No protein. Not enough protein. Okay. Well, we eat chicken. <coughs> they, don't, they don't have enough protein. Though. Okay. Now, the reason I'm saying that is I have a ministry now. It's an international ministry. It's the Chinese restaurant mission. Uh, of a Chinese restaurant mission. And what it is is the Broken Hearted brochure <coughs> has been translated into Chinese here. So what I do is when I go into a Chinese restaurant, I asked the waitress or the whoever is there, I said, can you read that? You know, and 
they'll look at it and they'll say, yes, Jesus Christ. Now, it, to me, it's just all marks and all that. Jesus Christ. I said, well, that's for you. That's part of the tip. And they, you think I was giving them gold. Seriously. It's amazing. So and I, I usually give four, and I'll say, please um, give this to some of your coworkers there, be the chef and the uh, uh, other waitresses. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Yes. So a friend of mine, now this gets bizarre. This is getting in the realm of bizarre. But a very good friend of mine, in fact, I'm in the ministry with him. He's a Jewish pastor from Houston that moved to Israel. And I said to him, uh, Don, I said, well, actually, no, his name now. I said, do you, uh, is there Chinese restaurants by any chance in Israel? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's several of them. So I sent him the brochures, and he had it with him in uh, the restaurant in Haifa. And the, the Chinese woman came by and saw it. He had it sitting on the, on the table. It turns out she was the owner. She came over and she picked it up and she read it. She said, I'm a believer. She said, I believe in, in Jesus Christ. She said, this is amazing. So it turns out she has connections with the Chinese community in Israel and she wanted uh, 200 to hand out to all the other Chinese restaurants and the uh, Chinese businessmen that are in Israel. So I mailed them over and I've got a Chinese restaurant ministry in Israel. <laughs> and then I was talking to the believers in Pakistan and the motel, not the motels, the hotels in Pakistan, most of them, or at least some of them, have Chinese restaurants. So they wanted them for the Chinese restaurants. Uh, so it's amazing now. So I want everybody here to take them. I brought a whole pile of them. And you're all going to be part of my Chinese restaurant, except you, my Chinese <laughs> restaurant ministry. And do exactly what I told you to do. What's that? I'm special. You're special. <laughs> you just go in there. I mean, when you're giving the, at the end, the, but with the tip, just ask, we'll assume it's a waitress, can you read this? And she'll look at it, and they're really surprised to see the Chinese. Yes, yes. Okay, that's for you. And take a couple others and give them to the other you know, cooks and, and waitresses. So please, are you going to join my ministry? The Chinese restaurant ministry? All right. And this one here, I just finished. And it's who is Israel? Pastor Ernie, there's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Who is Israel's Messiah? I'll give you three choices. All right. It would be, let me see, Israel. Uh, he was born 2,000 years ago in a city called Nazareth. Uh, well, actually, not. he wasn't born in Nazareth, but he was raised in Nazareth. It would be, let me see, uh, 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 Emmanuel. Yeah. Go ahead and name for it. All right. Okay. All right. And uh, through the years, I've had the uh, opportunity to uh, really interact to the point of thousands of hours with rabbis and Judaism's anti-missionaries. And I, in fact, I have brought some of my, my books with me that I wrote from my knowledge of, uh, of interacting with the rabbis. And I, I boiled down a message that I feel uh, is irrefutable, proving the Lord in fact, when I learned this message, the rabbis stopped debating it because I would bring it, I bring it to them, and there's no way to refute it, so they just, they just stopped. So I boiled it down to 1,500 words, and it's got in it enough that I, I feel uh, is really hard hitting. So I, I brought a pile of these with me. So if you know Jews, they're good for everybody, but particularly Jews. It's who is Israel's Messiah. I have a quote from one of their uh, distinguished ancient rabbis, Rabbi Maimonides, but they know him as the Rambam, about the coming of the Messiah. I'm also, Pastor, and I didn't mention this to you, but I'm gonna make a, it, it's gonna be less than a half hour, but where, I, and I spoke to the producer, it's Friday, and they agreed with it. We're gonna make a series of, the, of these. Um, and I've got, it's all laid out in my mind, probably be three-part series proving that only Jesus Christ could be Israel's Messiah. And it'll be a nice production um, with, you know, video production. It'll be an expansion of this, really. So that's what I'm in the process of, of doing also. And, and in August, we're shooting for August, this will be translated into Hebrew, and we're going to be distributing it. We've got ways of distributing it in Israel. So in, in, in August, this will be in Israel. Who is who was Israel's Messiah. I'll tell you, you know, we can look at the doom and gloom because there's plenty of it, amen? I mean, I don't have to go into depth here. Everybody knows what's going on. 
But we've got to look what the Lord's doing, too. Amen. Is that, that's what's exciting. You know, we got to, politically, we see this happening, that happening. But we've been praying, the group I'm with, we've been praying for years. I don't know how many years now. Um, I'm going to say five years, six years, maybe longer. Two nights a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we've been praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, the ministry opens up in India, and it opens up in Pakistan, it opens up in Kenya now. You should see what's going on in, in Kenya with, with this message, the healing the brokenhearted. The ministry's in Uganda, we're in Tanzania, we're in Zambia, uh, we're in Nigeria now, Malawi. I didn't even know Malawi was, I had to get a map of Africa and find Malawi. Um, uh, a Thailand, a Thailand, oh, Nepal just opened up. Nepal is, uh, pastors in Nepal are working with us. So we're praying for years for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I'm looking for it in America. Wrong. <laughs> That's right. Wrong is right. I'm looking for it in America, and here the Lord is, we're seeing thousands of Muslims coming to the Lord. I'm preaching live in Pakistan. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I call it the, the hour of visitation, is Pakistan, and Kenya, and India, and Sri Lanka. It's amazing. God is pouring out His Spirit. So we kind of have to kind of, it's not good here, but the Lord is moving mightily in other areas of, of, of the world. And it's exciting to see Muslims come to the Lord. I visually see them when I preach John 3.16 and Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. I, I, I see the Muslims coming to the Lord and some of them the very next day they want to get baptized. And we don't think of this that, that much in America because you could get baptized every day if you wanted to. But oh, in countries, Islamic countries, like Hindu and India, when you publicly are baptized, that is that really means something in those countries to the Muslims. That can, that's what is a sign to them that you're a real believer and you can be cut off, you can be killed, and all sorts of stuff can happen. So when the Muslims and the Hindus you know, want to be baptized, that's a real, real, real version of the Lord. All right, so we've got the positive. <coughs> now I've got to type a message up, Abraham or Lot. And just before I left, and wouldn't you know it, I had computer problems, and I couldn't print out what I wanted to print out about this message, because I feel it's very, very important. And so I've, I have, it's a sermon that I put together that I actually having a brochure, brochure for him, and I want to read from it, which we'll see how that goes. Um, it's the first time I've kind of ever read like that. Usually it's more uh, just spontaneous. But as I was going over it, I felt that the way that it was written, well, I wrote it, <laughs> would be appropriate to present, and then I'll, I'll comment on it. And is the verse up there? Do you have the verse from uh, Genesis 18, 7? Yeah, uh, uh, 1817. Uh, the, the key there is, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that, which, that thing which I'm to do? God is about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. He's, he's on the verge of judging him. And he came to Abraham. And he said to Abraham, you know, or he's talking, he says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I uh, am going to do? And it's very important as I go into this and show you because God wanted an intercessor at the time of judgment. He wanted someone to intercede. And Abraham was the man that was going to intercede. But Lot could not intercede. Lot was sitting ground zero for judgment. Abraham was aware God could use Abraham. Lot could not be used. Abraham's intercession was what got Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we have today, we have believers that are Abraham, and we have believers that are Lot. And I want to draw that distinction, uh, and it's going to be a two-part series. That's what I'm going to do in the first part. And I want to draw the distinction, and the beautiful thing about this is to be used of God as, a Abra as an Abraham, where God was going to tell him the judgment, and that what did Abraham do when God revealed the judgment to him? He got in his spirit and never seen it. Scripture clearly tells us how we can be of Abraham. Clearly, and he, the Scripture tells us 
what happened to Lot and how he ended up blinded and the judgment was virtually hours away and he didn't have a clue. And I want to be of Abraham, amen? amen. And I'm sure everybody here wants to be of Abraham. And hopefully everybody, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but <laughs> I don't know. And maybe you can take the message and go someplace with it. But let's look at, at Abraham and his faith. And we find that in uh, Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as a stranger, as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him uh, of the same promise. Now look at verse 11, uh, 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, that was Abraham's focus. Abraham's focus was not this world. We all have to live in the world, right? But that doesn't mean we're of the world. We're anchored in the world. Abraham was living in this world, but he was looking for the New Jerusalem. And he was looking for the Messiah, the Savior. That was Abraham's foundation. That was Abraham's goal. Look at verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for the New Jerusalem. That's what he was looking for, and living with the Lord forever. Genesis 18 and 19 reveals truths from the Bible that have a direct application for us today. It shows how Abraham was attuned with God, and, and God revealed him the, the coming judgment, the soon judgment that was going to completely destroy Sodom and Gomorrah along with five other cities. These cities were completely given over to sin and fornication. Now, you know, I, I think we're almost at the level. We're, we're very shortly away from, it talks about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plains, five other cities. Well, I think we can put in there, how about Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, um, Chicago, it's five. Uh, New York City, that's Babylon. And I'll, I'll throw Cleveland in. How about, you think Cleveland fits in Pastor? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we are fast. I mean, there has to be, if, if 100, if Sodom and Gomorrah equal 100%, parts of America now must be 95%. But fast going towards 100%. Fast going. So, what what I think what applies to Abraham's day with Sodom and Gomorrah applies to us today here in the modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, on the other hand, was giving was living in ground zero of this judgment. He had no idea it was on the way. He was completely blinded to God's judgment, which was about to be unleashed where he was living. Could you go to the next verse? Okay. Now, at least we kind of condemn uh, Lot, we got to remember what God says about it. it. The Bible says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrowing, uh, making them an example unto those that should live after, should live on God. That, that light is hard to see. It. Turning, uh, and verse 7, that's the key verse, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy uh, lifestyle of the wicked. Now look, it calls him just Lot. That's not me. That's the word of God. He's living in Sodom and Gomorrah, yet he calls him just Lot. Can you go for the for the next one? Next verse? verse eight. Now look what he said. Look what it says. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now he's called just Lot. And the word calls him righteous lot. Now, even though he was just, now this is very important how parsing this, even though he was just, and even though he was righteous, you notice he didn't know the judgment was upon him. You see that? Because he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says he was vexed in his soul. All the stuff around him. Uh, he was living in the midst of it. He wasn't happy with it. He wasn't really even partaking with it, in it, but yet he did not know the judgment was coming. And I'm going to show you why he didn't know and why Abraham knew the judgment was coming. But the, so as I'm sharing this, remember, 
The Bible calls Lot just and righteous, and yet he didn't know that judgment was upon him. Abraham knew it was on the way, while Lot had no idea. There were reasons why God warned Abraham of the coming catastrophic judgment of sin, and Lot was blind. The reasons are still valid today, and we're going to apply them to us. Lot was, Lot was upset with the sin of Sodom, but that was not enough, which I've covered already. Uh, enough to hear from God, and just like today, there are many who are upset with the sin of America, but that is not enough to hear from God about judgment. The problem was Lot was living in Sodom and unknowingly became part of it. He was drawn to Sodom because of the wealth and the lifestyle of it. He made a conscious decision to be part of Sodom. By doing this, he blocked hearing God's voice and warning, which led to disastrous consequences for him and his family. Now, and I share from uh, Genesis 13, 16. So what happened was, Abraham made a choice in his life that he wasn't going near Sodom anymore. Lot made a choice that he wasn't going to go there. And that starts the difference between Abraham and Lot. It was a conscious <coughs> decision that was made. And we have to be very careful and seek the Lord for the decisions we make. Amen. Amen, Pastor Ernie? Amen. Right. Like, let's say, uh, and I know this from, not that it happened to me, but I know it from people that I I, I work with. Um, they wanted the promotion. They wanted to go to uh, Washington. You know, I was a federal agent. They wanted to, to become a, you know, an advanced you know, GS levels, they call it, in Washington. Well, they went down there, and, they, and then I hear uh, two years later they're divorced. You know, it, everything blew apart. The whole family blew apart by going down there. It just, the wife couldn't handle it. I don't know, the, he changed. A lot. The wife couldn't handle it. The kids were, he's spending so much time, he had no time with the kids. See, it's a decision was, is it worth it? Is it worth it, in this case, like the example I'm giving, to move to Washington where there are ramifications that it could destroy your family? Of course it's not. I don't care what position you should get with the government. It's not worth it. Amen? Amen. So a decision was made that ended up destroying the family, which probably still has ramifications to today, even though that may have happened 30 years ago. Okay, now let me read. I, you don't have this verse. Let me read from here. Uh, Genesis 13, starting at verse 6. And the land was not able to bear them. That means Lot and uh, Abraham, because God had blessed them so much, that they might dwell together. For the substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. It is not, uh, is not the whole land before you. Separate you thyself, I pray thee, from me. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, and all that was watered there where the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that Lot, before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. So what did Lot do? He, he could have gone other places. He decided he was going to go to Sodom. He was not, not, not in Sodom, but he was going to move actually close to Sodom. That's what the word says here. So he makes a choice where he's going to go and live near Sodom. Sodom was alluring to Lot, and Ezekiel 16 uh, states that it was, he, it was so alluring. These people were haughty, full of pride. Uh, they were wealthy, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. The land was full of abominations, which means homosexuality. It appears that Lot looked, overlooked the sin of Sodom to, to live the good life. He was drawn by the easy lifestyle. He did not fear God about judging this sin. So it's a lot, hey, this looks like a good deal. I can live near Sodom, increase my wealth. I can be, look at all the, the, the leisure time there, all the food that's there. I don't have to work as hard as I'm doing now. I'm going to go to Sodom. Knowing full well the land was full of abominations. Amen? So he made a choice to like nestle in and get close to sin. Why? For an easy life, for materialism for wealth, 
nothing to do with the Lord. He, it was all to do with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. After they separated, Lot moved close to Sodom. The Bible makes it very clear that at this time, the people of Sodom were exceedingly wicked before the Lord. Lot knew this, yet he moved his family close to Sodom while Abraham stayed away. Again, Lot chose the easy lifestyle, knowing full well that the people were given over to sin. The use of the words exceedingly wicked means that they were consumed with sin. The thoughts, deeds, and actions were continually so sinful. Then Genesis 13, 12 says, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled yeah, in the plains, in, in, uh, in the cities of the plains, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. In Genesis 19, 1, Lot is sitting at the gate. So when the judgment comes, when the judgment is about to hit Sodom, in Genesis 13, Sodom is like sort of in the suburbs. In Genesis 19, he's sitting at the gate of Sodom. Now that doesn't mean too much to us today. When you study the Bible, at the gate, the gate of a city was a group where the position of authority was. Taxes were collected there. Decrees were made there. Uh, strangers had to get approved to come into the city, let's say. So Lot sitting at the gate means that Lot now is in a position of authority. Someone. The Bible doesn't say, but who knows what the thought position was. But he's not just an average person in Sodom. He is somehow in power and authority in Sodom. So in Genesis 13, he pitches his tent in the plains near Sodom. In Genesis 19, he's sitting at the gate of Sodom. He, 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 became, he became like absorbed with Sodom. But 2 Peter says he's just and righteous. It's like a conflict, doesn't it? It's odd. The Bible still calls him just and righteous, yet he's sitting at the gate in Sodom. Once Lot separated from Abraham, he was drawn to Sodom until he became part of, part of him. That's why he, he couldn't hear the judgment. The, 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 the element he was in in Sodom, he quenched the Holy Spirit. Even though the Bible says he was just and righteous, he, maybe he was in it just to make money. You know, he wasn't partaking in the, all the abominations of it. He might have been in there just to make money, an easy life. You know, hey, we can go to the Colosseum or whatever it was and, and watch the, the music. Or, I don't know what, what the easy life was back then compared to now, but that's what he wanted. He made a trade-off, and when he made the trade-off, God cut him off. God's voice was cut off, although he still remained uh, righteous and just. Abraham would have nothing to do with Sodom. Uh, we look at, Ab at Genesis 14. And uh, when Abraham actually saved Lot you know, in battle, and he saved the kings of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember that story in Genesis 14, 20, uh, starting at uh, 21, they, the king of Sodom wanted to bless uh, Abraham for what he had done. And Abraham wouldn't take anything from him. He didn't want, he wouldn't take anything. And Abraham said, lest, lest it be made that, that the king of Sodom may be rich. So Abraham was completely cut off. He knew the wickedness. He knew, see, it's clear now. Abraham knew how wicked Sodom was. The people knew how wicked Sodom was. Abraham wouldn't even take a penny from the king of Sodom. He wanted nothing but Lot is in Sodom. And Abraham, had, he had a, like a, he was very wealthy. He had like a small army. And when Lot and the people of Sodom were captured, Abraham's army went and fought a battle and saved Lot. So, but Abraham, knowing what was in Lot, I mean, knowing what was in Sodom, wouldn't take a penny, not a penny. He didn't want any connection whatsoever with Sodom anymore. Okay, just prior to judging um, Lot, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18. And Genesis 18, verses, uh, we'll say, 17 through 19, 
tells us what triggered God's reaching out to Abraham, warning him of the judgment to come. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So God is showing the covenant that he's made with Abraham. God has made a covenant with Abraham, and in him are all the nations of the earth going to be blessed. And obviously that's through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now look at this. Now, So here is... The criteria for God to bless Abraham, so we'll say with prophetic knowledge. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that which the Lord may bring upon Abraham, that which he has spoken of him. So Abraham was a family man. Pure and simple. He didn't have five theological degrees. He didn't go to a seminary. Anybody can fulfill what Abraham did. Abraham was a family man, and what is he going to do? He's going to teach the family and his children, so it will be kept a lineage, right? They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Abraham wouldn't dare bring his family to Sodom. He knew. He knew what would happen. He wouldn't go near the place, well, probably for his own sake, but his heritage, for his family's sake, for his children's sake. He knew how corrupting it was. Abraham would do anything to protect his family, his children, that they wouldn't be corrupted. And there'll be a godly heritage. He taught them justice and judgment, that that covenant could continue down the years. That's all it took, folks. And that's a big, it sounds simple on paper. But living uh, today like we live, it takes an effort, but God will bless everybody the same. If we make an effort to protect our children from Sodom, that's the local school. And it may take a lot of work. It may take work to protect them from uh, kids that they're involved in. Uh, we, are back, we are backing into paganism here. The, the rock music, it's, it's, it's hellish. And I get, you should see the reaction I get when I state this. I get incredible. Probably that's one of the most things I get attacked about when I go after this rock music. And you can kind of see where it's come to now when you get this guy, um, and I knew really nothing about him. Bowie, what's his first name? David Bowie. David Bowie, and now Lady Gaga. They are androgynous. They're, uh, they're followers of, um, That guy, that British guy. Alistair. Alistair Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. Oh, Crowley. He's the one that they, they inspired. He's the, they inspired him. And he was one of the most wicked men on earth. And by the way, we're putting together a documentary on this right now as I speak. Um, and the, the Alistair Crowley is really the father of modern this modern world we live in. And many, many, many respects, and the Beatles like, were, were dedicated to him, and I've got proof on that, starting with uh, mm -hmm. Sgt. Pepper. Sgt. Pepper, yeah. That changed everything. And then the Led Zeppelin followed in. And, um, uh, uh, no, the, uh, see, I don't want to get into this because it burns my mind, but <laughs> I just want to give you a little cover of it. The uh, Rolling Stones, yeah. the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. They brought Alex to Crowley was like the foundation of it. Then we get Led Zeppelin and what, Stairway to Heaven? Yep. That's all laced with Alex to Crowley. Alex to Crowley was thrown out of Italy by Mussolini himself because he the, there was such strong beliefs that he was sacrificing to. They, they threw him house. out. Excuse me. Carol Hall bought his house. Yeah, and, and um, the, 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 one of the guitarists, right? The what? drummer? Oh, yeah, uh, from, from Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. Page. They bought his house in Scotland. I mean, there's a huge connection. This man was considered one of the most evil men that ever lived. He was, um, he came from a brethren family. His, his mother and father were in the brethren family, uh, brethren church. 
And he purposely said he renounced the Christ and he wanted to destroy Christianity. That was the goal of Alex the Crowder. And I can't go through the whole thing now other than the modern music that we're seeing is coming from him. He's the inspiration. Yep. Some of the songs that they, they you know they got his like things about him. They're singing songs to him. Yep. So we Rome. can't let our children go into this stuff. Rome, Rome Stones wrote sympathy for the devil. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean it goes beyond Alex and Crowley. But folks, the modern music that our, our children want to listen to, our grandchildren, that they're watching these Grammys and they're watching the Super Bowl halftime, it is pure devil. Pure. Amen. That's it. Pure. We got to keep. Abraham keeps them out. Keeps them away from it, protects them from it. Lot, okay, you can listen to it or hurt you. you know, go ahead. Or they don't care. Or don't care. See, and now, then the, uh, we got the tattooing. And when I write about yes, sir. when I write about tattooing, I get all these, I get all these emails, you know, judgmental and all, all the pagans were full of tattoos. Yes, sir. The pagans had their, their, their own music. <clears throat> the, the default of man, when I say the default, you know, like what you, the bottom line, what you fall into, is paganism. So we have, we have, uh, <laughs> this is Georgianne, she's working with me. Georgianne, you never guess who I'm talking about. I don't know, but it took me forever to find this stinking uh, place. About <laughs> hope. About hope. But um, we're backing into paganism, the, the, the sexual stuff that's going on. It has a an end game. And that end game is the way the pagans work. The pagans were totally uh, lasciviousness, totally. Um, there was no controls, no anything. We can see that in Leviticus chapter 18. That's where we're heading as a nation because we've rejected God. That doesn't mean this church, but as a nation, that's where we're heading. Amen. So we've got the, the sexual mores, shall we say, of the pagans. We've got the pagan music. We've got the pagan, um, the pagan uh, well, the tattoos. Now, if anybody's got tattoos on, on you, I'm not condemning you. Um, uh, you know, because that you, you'll be forgiven in Christ. But the whole, the culture of it, the tattoos, the, the, all of it, the music, is all we're becoming pagan. We're becoming a pagan nation. We must protect our children from this. We cannot turn them over to it. That's what Lot did. He turned his children over to it. And what happened? He turned it over to him by living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he lost everything. When the judgment fell, he lost his wife, he lost whatever wealth he had in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when you read the account, Lot went to his like son-in-laws. I don't know how many children he had. He went to his son-in-laws and told them the judgment is imminent. And they mocked him. Remember the scriptures? They mocked him. He had no witness. They wouldn't pay attention to him. He came out with two daughters, and they were still full of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And they, they had a, an incestual relationship with them. And what were the names of the two children? Ammon and Moab. They became enemies of Israel. So his, and then when you read in the prophet Zephaniah chapter 2, those countries, Ammon is northern Jordan today. In fact, the capital of Jordan is Ammon. And the central part is Moab. So Jordan is like descendant from Lot. Uh, and what, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, when you read Zephaniah chapter 2, all of them are going to be killed, and the nation is going to be obliterated and turned into Sodom and Gomorrah, and never to be inhabited again. You'll see that right in chapter 2 of the prophet Zephaniah. So what's Lot's heritage? To, to enemies of Israel, incestuous, incestuous relationships, all descendants being obliterated? What's Abraham's um, heritage? A godly seed, bringing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham, through the Lord, will have a millennial reign, and Israel will be greatly blessed. Us, coming into the, 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 the faith through the Lord, right? Isn't that Abraham's heritage? So today, we must, this world is alluring, just like some of the world. Abraham made a conscious decision that he's not going to lie. He's not putting his children there. He's going to raise his children, just as the scripture says, that they, um, that they would, uh, I don't know where it went. Uh, anyways, in righteousness, and he's going to raise them up um, according to the Lord. His whole family. Lot lost everything in the end, folks. Everything. 
So what I'm asking today is that uh, we make a commitment. And we, first of all, we, have, we need to have discernment that what maybe looks OK and what's acceptable society is radically wrong with the Lord. Abraham saw that and made that decision. We have to make a decision to protect our family, our children, our grandchildren, nephews, nieces, whoever we can. Uh, from this world system, and it can be tough because that music's alluring, they want tattoos, it's alluring, the, the, the sex is just wide open, it's all alluring, but we must do and pray and intercede, we we'll cry out to them. That is the heart of Abraham. And when we're like that, when we have Abraham's heart like that, that's when God will tell you the judgment's imminent. You know, and, and what did Abraham do? When God revealed it to him, remember the, the old story, Lord, if, if you if there be fifty righteous, forty right, because he knew Lot was there, and you know I don't know, I don't remember exact numbers, but it got down to ten. Lord, will you spare it for ten? And the Lord said, Yes, I'll spare it. But he couldn't find ten. He couldn't find ten. But Lot interceded. Lot didn't cheer like, Yay, Lord, bring that destruction on Cleveland. All right. The Lord didn't say that. Abraham didn't do that. Abraham cried out to the Lord. That, that's why one of the reasons why God showed him the judgment coming was he knew Abraham would cry out to him, and God sent the angels to bring um, uh, Lot out because I believe in Abraham's intercession. And until I studied this, I never realized it. But when you look at scriptures, I just those things that you read over scriptures, you know, until, until you study it. But when God was raining fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah, where was Abraham? He was overlooking it. Abraham saw the judgment fall. It says Abraham got up early in the morning, and apparently he was on some mountain, and he knew, that, I guess the Lord maybe told him some details about the judgment. Abraham was standing there, and he was watching Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed by the Lord. While Lot was running for his life and lost everything. So I pray that everyone here, everybody listening, would be of Abraham and not of Lot. Uh, let me close in a word of prayer. Father, if we have allowed Sodom and Gomorrah into us like Lot did, even though he was called righteous and just, I'm asking now that we repent of it and that we get that out of us. If we haven't acted as uh, fathers and mothers, according to your word with our children, I ask for repentance now, and that we would seek you for your strength and your power to help protect our children from the Sodom and Gomorrah that we live in here. Father, I'm asking also that as we line up with Abraham and you show us what's coming, that we live as intercessors, that we would cry out like you, uh, like Abraham did, and Abraham was solemn as he watched the judgment, and that we would have that same spirit with Not a spirit of, yes, we want to see him destroyed, but a spirit of sorrow, Lord. Um, because the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, all should come to the end. And it is not the will, it's not your will, Lord, for destruction. Your will is that nations repent. That's your will. Uh, you only judge like Sodom and Gomorrah as the last resort. And I thank you now. Amen. Can come back next week and do part two? That was John McTurden. And folks, we're coming to you again.